This is a 2018 Porsche Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo, which is a lot of name for a lot of car, but basically this is a Panamera Turbo station wagon. The sticker price on this car is just shy of $183,000, which makes this the most expensive station wagon ever made. Then again, it's also one of the coolest station wagons ever made. This thing has 550 horsepower, which is more than a 911 turbo in a station wagon. I've borrowed this Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo from Porsche of Warrington here in the Philadelphia suburbs. They always have a lot of really cool cars in their inventory, but today this is the coolest, a 550 horsepower, $180,000 station wagon. Now, I've always loved fast wagons because of what they offer. Basically, sports car performance combined with family wagon practicality. In fact, my personal car is a 2012 Mercedes-Benz E63 AMG wagon, but that car has a paltry 520 horsepower, and the sticker price back when it was new was only around 100 grand. This thing laughs at my wagon. It has way more horsepower. It has all-wheel drive and way better technology although it costs about four times what I paid for my used wagon. But the question you may have is, what? Porsche is making a station wagon? And the answer is, yes, they are. They took their regular Panamera Turbo hatchbacky sedan thing, they squared off the back end, and now you have a 550 horsepower turbocharged V8 station wagon. Except Porsche calls it a sport turismo because the term station wagon reminds people of this uncool thing. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, today I'm going to show you around the Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the world's most expensive station wagon. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. I've also created a list of the most expensive used Porsche models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now, I'm going to start with what everybody is most interested in learning about, the new thing that would be the back. Specifically, I'm going to start with a comparison to a standard Panamera. Now, the Panamera Sport Turismo doesn't look too station wagony until you get it next to the regular one, and then you can see there are some pretty substantial differences. You can see that the regular Panamera sort of slopes down a lot more gradually, whereas this, the Panamera Sport Turismo, is extended out a lot further, and it definitely has more of a station wagon look when you compare the two cars. But Beyond the styling differences, something you're probably wondering about is the size differences, and in terms of cargo space, these two are actually fairly close. With the seats in place, the regular Panamera has 17.4 cubic feet of cargo space. The wagon has 18.3. It's only about an 8% difference. With the seats folded, this one has 46 cubic feet of cargo space, and this one has 49 cubic feet. They're really not all that far apart, but that surprises me because if you actually open up the back of this thing, one thing you will find is that this thing looks a lot bigger than this one, something I will now demonstrate by climbing inside, which, by the way, is something I could never do in the old one, especially if you close the hatch. I am totally comfortable back here. Oh, and I wish I had come up with a plan before I did this about how I was going to get out. Nonetheless, it is bigger than the other one, Next up, with the cars like this, you can see a few other rear-end differences. That is the regular Panamera, and this is the Sport Turismo. Now, one big difference is the load floor height. The regular Panamera keeps the license plate fixed on the bumper, and that means that the load floor is higher. The Panamera Sport Turismo puts it in the tailgate, so it has a lower load floor, which makes it easier to get items into the Sport Turismo. Now, if you look at the cargo area in the Sport Turismo, you can see that it's about as wide and as deep as the cargo area inside the regular Panamera, the difference is in height. The Sport Turismo's roof extends further, and that means you can get larger, taller items in the back of this one. Like, for example, furniture, if you wanted to use your Panamera to move, or me when I climbed in just a second ago. Another big difference between the two Panameras 
is the cargo cover. Now, the regular Panamera has a pretty standard cargo cover. It's just a regular cargo cover held onto the tailgate with a couple of little strings. When you close it, it closes and covers the cargo area. It's exactly what you'd find in a Volkswagen Golf. Now, the cargo cover in the Sport Turismo is a little bit more unusual. It's a retractable, just like it is in most SUVs, but unlike in most other cars, you don't clip it on to the sides of the cargo area. Instead, you clip it on to the tailgate, which is a rather cumbersome process that's easiest done from the back seat. Now, once you've done that, when you open the tailgate, the cargo cover sort of stretches all the way out like it's doing some sort of stretch before a long exercise. It's very unusual. When you close the tailgate, it goes right back in, and then it covers your cargo completely so you can drive around your Panamera Sport Turismo and keep whatever you need in the back a complete secret. And finally, our last cargo area related item. With the cargo cover removed and the back seats down, there really is a lot of room back here. I'm six foot four and I'm lying down in the back of a Panamera. So this would be a perfect car for the crowd who's just upset that they can't sleep inside their 911. Okay, so I'm done with the rear cargo area, but there's still a couple more interesting rear items to cover in the Sport Turismo, starting with the rear wing. Now, this may just look like a regular old roof spoiler to you. They're putting these on SUVs now, but it's a little bit more than that. If you go into the infotainment system and go into the spoiler section, you can actually raise up this rear roof spoiler. In fact, this is the world's first electronically adjustable roof spoiler. No other car has ever had this before. Unfortunately, it doesn't come all the way out like the spoiler in the regular Panamera Turbo, but hey, it's better than nothing if you want to drive around and call attention to your cool station wagon. The next rear item that's a little bit different in the Panamera Sport Turismo compared to the standard Panamera is maybe the most important, the rear seat. It has three seats back here. Every single other Panamera before this was a four-seater, two in the front, two in the back, but this one has three seats. A full rear bench. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work all that well. You see, the giant center console still extends all the way down the middle of this car, just like it does in the standard Panamera. So if you're the unlucky person who has to sit in the middle seat, you got to do one of these and sort of straddle this giant rear center console and stick your foot in each side's passenger foot well, which will of course annoy the people on either side of you. So this is a five-seater vehicle, but it's like Porsche was like, we don't really want to develop a new center console. So, well, it's a five-seater vehicle in theory only. Next up, a couple of other interesting rear seat items. One is that there is a giant LCD screen in that center tunnel aimed at the rear seat passengers. So if you have a middle passenger in here and he has to swing his leg over, he better not hit that LCD screen because it's probably like three grand to replace. And that probably isn't really the best place to put someone's feet. Nonetheless, if you want to carry five people in this car, that's what you have to do. Next up, climbing into the front of the car, I'm going to show you the rest of the quirks and features. Now, it's worth noting I've already done a review of the standard Panamera Turbo non-Sport Turismo, the regular one, and so I'm just going to cover in this review some of the highlights from that, along with a few things I missed while I was reviewing that car. I'm going to link that review in the description below for a more in-depth look at the Panamera Turbo. Nonetheless, we must start with the center climate vent. Now, the outer climate vents in the front are fairly normal. You just move them around, you can close them or open them, whatever, but the center climate vent is controlled through the center touch screen. Screen. If you want to move the center climate vent, you go into the center climate vent area in the touch screen and then you move your hand on the screen and the climate vent follows suit. If you want to move it up and down, you can see the climate vent does whatever you tell it to on the screen. I have never seen a climate vent that was moved with a screen before. It's crazy. And it's split up into two, so the driver and passenger can control their own center climate vent. Now, the interesting thing about the center climate vent that I didn't notice in my earlier Panamera Turbo review is the climate vents on the top of the dashboard are manually movable. You don't see that in just about any car. Usually the things that help you defrost the windshield, those are just placed where they're placed. You can't do anything about it. It, but in this car, you can move them. So you have to go into a screen to move the climate vent in the center, but you can move the windshield defroster vents on the top of the dashboard. Next up, moving on to some other interesting quirks, starting with the fact that all of the center console buttons are just part of an electronic touchpad. When the car is off, 
they're gone, they're disappeared, you can't see them. It's not until you turn the car on that they light up and let you know what they can do. And then you just sort of tap them and then they do what you want. You wanna turn on your heated seat, your cooled seat, whatever. They're all just these little electronic touchpad buttons. When you turn the car back off, the buttons go away and you can't see them anymore. And it has this nice clean black appearance that isn't cluttered with all sorts of traditional buttons. Also, speaking of that center touchpad, Pad. One thing I really like, there are a couple of physical switches on them. There are these silver buttons that control the temperature, the amount of air, and the stereo volume. They are all very high quality. When the car is on, they look really cool, but turn the car off and they look even cooler. It's just sort of these silver switches placed on this black electronic pad. It's a nice look, and I really, really like using those physical things to adjust the volume and the temperature rather than trying to press the screen since you're doing the volume of the temperature pretty often. Next up, another interesting item. Above the touchscreen, you will see the clock, which is one of the strangest clocks you will ever lay eyes on. The actual time display is in the middle of the clock in very small little print. And then the entire face of the clock is consumed with the second hand, which is something that nobody has ever cared about in history. I guess for some reason, Porsche feels that seconds are more important than minutes and hours. If you call someone and they're driving in their Panamera, they can very easily tell you what second it is within the minute. Next up, the gear lever is a little bit weird, but that in itself is not all that unusual. It's like there's a competition among the luxury brands these days to see who can make the strangest gear lever, and this is certainly one of the competitors. Now, reverse, neutral, and drive are fairly normal, although they're all pretty close together, and neutral is a little hard to select. You have to kind of be looking at the gauge cluster, which tells you which gear you're in, but the weirdest part is park. Park isn't next to reverse, neutral, or drive. Instead, it's a little button at the base of the shift lever, very tiny, tinier, for instance, than the heated seat button, you have to be very certain that you want to put your Panamera in park. Beyond the gear lever, another odd item is simply starting the car. Every other luxury car, you get inside, you leave the key in your pocket, you push a button and it starts. This car, you get inside, you leave the key in your pocket, and then you turn this little plastic thing that sticks out from the left side of the steering wheel, and that's what starts the car. I'm not sure why there's no push button. Instead, it's a little dial lever thing, but I guess Porsche has decided that that is better than a button for some bizarre reason. One more weird interior item, by the way, is the leather in the center console. The center console sort of comes together and then goes all the way to the back, but for some reason, one part ends and they finish it, and then another part immediately begins and then they start it. You think to make the car sort of look a little nicer, they would have just made that one flowing piece, but instead it is decidedly two pieces, both with stitching that sort of faces each other. It's a very interesting design element. I'm not really sure why they did it that way. Next up, moving on to some of the infotainment system quirks I didn't cover when I reviewed the Panamera Turbo originally. I'm going to start with the navigation settings. You'll see one that gives you the option of choosing which route you want to take, the fastest route, the shortest and distance route, or the ecological route. Now, this isn't all that uncommon. Most automakers let you choose the greenest route, the most economical route, but I've never seen ecological used before. I think that is technically right, but maybe it's a little bit of a mistranslation. Next up, you move on to the vehicle lighting settings. If you go into vehicle lighting, one of the options you will see is for a feature called LED Matrix High Beam Assistant. Below that, it says High Beam Adaptation on Vehicle Recognition. Now, I have no idea what that means, and obviously no one does. It really makes no sense. But nonetheless, if you get a Panamera Turbo, you have it. Also interesting, if you go into the Porsche Connect apps and check their expiration date, you will see that they expire in the year 2117. I think they're intended to last indefinitely. If you buy one of these, you'll have Porsche Connect for as long as you want, but there is an expiration date. So if you have one of these for 99 years, folks, your Porsche Connect will stop working. Time to start a letter writing campaign. Next up, we have to move on to the apps, which I find to be kind of ridiculous. I don't cover this in a lot of cars, but it seems to be working in this one. So let's start, for example, with flights. It allows you to choose an airport, so I'll choose the closest big one, Philadelphia, and then it shows you all of the recent flights. For example, there's this flight from Allentown, looks like it's 19 minutes late. There's one from State College, three minutes early. Milwaukee, hour and a half late. Sorry, folks, you're missing your connection. Keep scrolling through here. Ooh, there's a Charlotte flight that's going to be five minutes late. Cincinnati, you can go to later.
later flights. For some reason, it just displays which flights are coming if you just want to kind of check out what's on tap to your local airport. I'm not sure why anyone would use this, but nonetheless, you have the opportunity to. Ooh, there's a flight from Burlington, Vermont. It's going to be seven minutes early. Pretty good, Burlington. You can get some extra time in Philly Airport. The next app I like is the one for fuel prices. Now, when I'm looking for gas, I think about which one is the cheapest in the area, but I've never really had them displayed for me. You can really see who's screwing you. For example, that Easton gas charging 369.9, Luke Oil's charging 349.9, Shell 337.9, Sparta is only 329.9, no idea what that is. Sitgo 379.9, what are they putting champagne in the gas over at the Sitgo? I think I'm gonna go to Sparta in my $180,000 twin turbo V8 Panamera. Save 20 cents a gallon on fuel. One other interesting item, the infotainment system, you go into vehicle settings and there is an option that lets you adjust the passenger seat from the driver's seat. And the way it works is weird. If you turn it on in the infotainment system, then the controls on the side of the driver's seat where you normally adjust the driver's seat now control the passenger seat, which is a very odd feeling. You're moving the seat forward and nothing happens, but then you see the passenger seat move forward. It's very weird, but it means you can get the passenger seat into the exact right position before your passenger enters, or you can move the seat forward if someone in back is complaining about leg room. Next up, moving on to the outside of the car, starting with the rear. Now this car has a light bar back here, which is no surprise. That's like the hot new thing in the car industry. Everybody seems to be going to these giant rear taillight bars that span the entire rear end. But if you look closely, you'll notice that this one doesn't quite span the entire rear end. It comes to a little point in the middle where it has to take just a little break. I guess Porsche couldn't find a supplier to provide them with one light bar that went across the entire your tailgate. Anyway, speaking of the rear, while I'm back here, we might as well listen to the exhaust note, which sounds a little different from a traditional station wagon. Take a listen. <laughs> interesting back here, this car has rear axle steering. It is an expensive extra option, but this car has it for additional performance, better handling, and I'm excited in a minute to get this out on the road and see exactly how it performs. Now, next up, I'm going to move under the hood, but before I show you the engine, I want to show you the key. Now, it's no secret that Porsche keys sort of have the Porsche shape to them. They're sort of supposed to evoke the look of the car that they're unlocking. My favorite Porsche key was the 03 Cayenne, which even had the little headlights of the Cayenne and actually really did look like an 03 Cayenne, but the headlights didn't light up. In fact, the keys never really did anything except lock or unlock until now. The latest key actually does flash the Porsche logo when you lock or unlock the doors to let you know that you've actually done something. It's kind of a cool look when you press your key at night and you see the outline of the Porsche logo flashing. All right, next up, take a look at the engine. This is Porsche's four liter turbocharged V8, 550 horsepower. It's a very sleek look to it. The most interesting quirk I found under the engine is this little warning label at the base of the engine with sort of a do not sign and a picture of a hand. And then it says below it, moving parts. Ah, yes. Thank you, Porsche, for reminding us that an engine contains moving parts. I'm glad that label is on there. I'm sure it will save many lives. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the window sticker. Now, like I said before, this car is around $183,000, which is a lot of money. Now, Porsche is known for their unusual and plentiful options. This one has a particularly interesting option, and that would be preparation for deletion of model designation. Now, if you take a look in the back, you'll see this car doesn't actually have the model designation deleted. Instead, the window sticker just has preparation for deletion of model designation. It hasn't actually done anything. Fortunately, Porsche is not charging for this option. It's zero dollars, but this might be a new option strategy for Porsche. Can you imagine Preparation for transparent windows, $500. Preparation for round wheels, $900. I guess that's to add to the profits you're already making from leather air vent slats. And so those are the quirks and features of the Porsche Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo, which by the way is a 32 letter name with 12 syllables and I would expect nothing less from Porsche. Anyway, now it's time to drive the world's craziest wagon. All right, driving the Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo. It's a bit of a mouthful. This is exciting. Now, like I said, I already did a video on the regular Panamera Turbo, so I'm not gonna drive this one for quite as long. It's It's got the rear axle steering, it's got the different rear end, but generally it's the same car. Already going here. Whoa! 
<laughs> it's just, it's really kind of fast. That's the thing about this car. Obviously it's very smooth and one of the first things you realize when you're driving this car, as much as you know it's a sports car and the one I drove before, it's very quiet, surprisingly so. Um, you know, you can put on the sport exhaust, I'm in sport mode now and the exhaust is on and you can hear it a little bit, but you don't hear a lot of ulterior stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not hearing car noise from the outside. I'm not hearing, you know, cars rush by, wind rush, tire noise, any of that stuff. Going around corners, it is obviously just tremendously well planted on the ground. There's nothing else you can say. Um, it drives like a true and incredible sports car. And one of the things I think you might be wondering, of course, is how does this compare to the E63 station wagon? And the answer is, um, well, first off, it's way more expensive. So does it drive better? Well, around corners, yeah, it does drive better. This car has a lower center of gravity, it's wider, uh, and it just feels like it, it handles a little bit better. It has less power. The E63S has like 605 horsepower. This has only 550, uh, and this is a larger car. So the E63 is a little bit faster. Um, which is an important consideration when you're spending a hundred or a hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Now obviously with the E63 you don't get the Porsche name, um, but as cool as this car is, that E63 presents a compelling value, which is almost hard to imagine saying considering how expensive it is, 120, um, compared to the Panamera. The interior in this car is very well appointed and sitting here, you feel like you're in a modern luxury car. It feels like, you know, the kind of interior you'd expect from a vehicle that costs $180,000. I don't necessarily know that that means that it's worth $180,000, but it does feel as you'd want it to if you spend sort of that level of money. The car just, it, it feels like a luxury car that's also a sports car that's also a family station wagon. And when you combine all those things, you start to say, well, 180 grand, you know, if I can only have one car, can't get my kids in a 911, you know, I, I, I need more space than that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I get a minivan, an SUV, it's just not as fun. What do I get? Well, this car does ha present a pretty cool proposition. Uh, it's just really expensive. This is probably more fun to drive than, than most other cars. It's certainly, on if you ever took it to a track, it would probably feel faster than an M5 and E63, that sort of thing. And obviously it's got decent cargo space. Um, but I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, is it really worth X amount more than an M5? M5 is a $100,000 car. This is a lot more money for you know, a couple extra cubic feet from a standard Panamera. And so that's the 2018 Porsche Panamera Turbo Sport Turismo. This thing is amazing. It drives and accelerates like a sports car, but it has actual cargo space. Yes, it costs $183,000, but this might just be the best car ever for your parents to bring you to soccer practice, as long as your parents are Bill and Melinda Gates. Anyway, now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I think the Sport Turismo is more attractive than the regular Panamera, but not enough to move the score a full point high and it gets a 6 out of 10. Next up is acceleration, 0 to 60 is 3.6 seconds and it gets an 8 out of 10. Handling is good but largely similar to the sedan even with that rear axle steering and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is very high, it's the cool new Panamera body style and it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, importance is stronger than average as it's a bit of a special car for Porsche and it gets a 6 out of 10. Added up in the weekend score is 33 out of 50, placing it a bit behind the E63 wagon, which is quicker and which I happen to think is a little better looking. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The Panamera Sport Turismo is very well equipped and it gets an 8 out of 10. Comfort is good, the car's ride is a bit harsh, but very quiet and solid and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is high and materials are excellent, though it gets a slight demerit for potential long-term reliability woes and it earns a 9 out of 10. Practicality is interesting. Despite only slightly better cargo room than the regular Panamera, it's enough to slightly bump up the Doug score and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, value, and the simple truth is that this car is just too expensive, which has been reflected in the lack of sales so far. There's just not a lot of interest in a station wagon at this price point that gets a 5 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 37 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 70 out of 100, which is a very strong score, but this is a very strong car that can basically do everything. It's a luxury car, a sports car, and a family car in one. It loses overall to the E63 wagon, which is more practical, faster, and cheaper, and it ties the BMW M760i, which is more comfortable and has better tech, but this is certainly in the realm of the best of the best.